The middle school I attended was once the first high school built in the downtown area of my hometown in the early 20th century. Comprised of three main halls, a gymnasium and a large office building where the library and auditorium were located. At this time, my mother worked in the main office and would work through the summer while students and teachers were gone. On one such day, she was in her office when she heard the front door open and the sound of a group of children walking toward the office. She called out with her normal friendly demeanour, expecting them to turn the corner any moment. Instead, she heard the door to the auditorium open and the sounds go with it. Now thinking some children were where they were not supposed to be, she quickly got up and walked into the auditorium to tell them to leave. She was confronted with only empty and lonely seats and the dark, unlit stage. Feeling uneasy, she began her exit and as she did, she heard a child giggle somewhere in the darkness. Shortly after, she was again in the office alone, when suddenly she heard a loud banging coming from the library above her. Worried but dutiful, she made her way up the stairs and opened the door to the library. Every chair and table was tossed and tipped aside, haphazard and cluttered. Scared and annoyed, she quickly reset everything and made her exit. She would go on to complain for weeks about this repeating in that location. The final and most extreme of her experiences happened in the office. She was filing paperwork and organising things for the assistant principal, who was not on school premises at the time. She was walking back and forth between her office, the conference room, and the assistant principal's office. She had just walked into the conference room and felt a sharp and aggressive tug on the back of her head. She whirled around expecting to see an assailant, but there was nothing. Determined to stand her ground, she mustered up the courage and shouted at that she would not be bullied, or made afraid, and that she had work to do, as if reprimanding a child. After which, things calmed down in that building. The 8th grade hall was a whole other matter entirely. The summer going into 7th grade, we decided to do a little ghost hunting of our own. A trio composed of myself, my mother and my grandfather, emptied the empty hall in the late afternoon. We sat in the old steps in silence for a while, looking down the hall with our backs to the entry to the girls' gym. After a while, we began to hear what sounded like footsteps on the old basketball courts in the girls' gym. Startled but excited, we quietly walked into the empty gym. The court creaked and whined as we walked across it, until we came to a halt in the middle and just stood there for a minute. An eerie feeling came over us and a creaking began to sound from the court, as if footsteps were circling around us. Feeling uneasy, we began our exit. As we opened the double doors of the gym onto the main hall, all three of us looked down at the end of the hall that connects the 7th and 8th grade halls together and saw a tall, thin and inky black figure swiftly glide across from right to left and out of sight. Filled with hormonal courage, I tar- charged down the hallway towards it, but by the time I reached the end of the hall, there was nothing to be seen. Freaked out, we called it a day. Some time later, after school hours, I had just finished training with the track and field team and was walking up to the main office where my mother was. As I was walking, I began to hear a loud and repetitive banging noise. Confused, I looked around for the source. I looked up and through the high windows of the girls' locker room, could see a single locker door opening and slamming shut repetitively, with force, by itself. I stood there for a minute in bemusement, thinking it was a vent or something causing it, but no other locker doors near it moved. It continued to slam loudly as I made my way to the office. I don't know when it stopped. The final tale I have from this location is the one that creeps me out the most. Over summer going into 8th grade, while the buildings were mostly empty, a group of electricians and custodians were tasked with climbing up into the crawl space above the 8th grade hall to solve a problem. They were going about their casual conversation in the front office, where my mom was, drinking coffee and laughing as she heard them exit and head to the hall. 
About 20 minutes passes, and she says they all enter the main office. None of them are talking, no laughing, their entire demeanour now off. These big, burly man's men are now pale as paper, and are avoiding eye contact with her. She approaches the main custodian, a friendly, usually candid older gentleman, and asks him what's wrong. He brushes her off in a somewhat rude manner, and nothing is wrong, and they're just working some things out. Two years pass, and none of these men will speak a word about it until one day, my mother confronts the main custodian, demanding what made him act so craven that day. He breaks and finally tells her, says that he and a few of the guys went up into the crawl space that day, that they had been working up for ten minutes when they saw something. Something that scared these men so badly, they would rather be reprimanded for not doing the job than go back up there. Men who pride themselves on their integrity, turning away from their responsibility out of fear of what was up there. When she pressed him for more details, he refused and told her to drop it, never speaking about it ever again. When I was a young child, three to five, my father moved around a lot. He's ex-military and at the time had just settled into his second marriage and moved into a house in Pocatello, Idaho. I remember how excited I was the first time I saw it. A real house, not an apartment or manufactured home, but a real house. Old and sturdy. The thing that struck out to me the most was its paint job. Snow white over the old wooden panelling and scarlet red stairs leading up to a large black door. Something about the red stairs weirded me out, but I was so excited because it was a big house in a town I liked, and I was given a room all to myself. Weeks passed, and by the way my father tells it, little things began to happen. He would stay up late into the night, and when he would get ready for bed, would notice the basement light peeking through the old black wood floors. He would go down there and turn the light off only to be confronted with the light shining through the floorboards upon reaching the top of the stairs. This little game continued on and off for a few weeks, with his frustration and concern growing. Then one day, something happened that changed the atmosphere of the house completely. It was around midday, and I was in my room with a friend from school. We were playing with the realistic little animal toys you can usually find in craft stores. My father's wife came in to tell us, that the boy's mother was outside, waiting to take him home. We said our goodbyes, and I heard them exit the house. I began to clean up the toys that I usually kept in my closet. As I turned to carry the box of toys into the closet, I looked out the window into the garden, where my father and stepmother were having a conversation. Alone in my room and my back to the door, I placed the box in the closet and began rummaging through the toys. That's when I felt two large hands on my upper back. A powerful shove sent me tumbling into the closet, and the door slammed shut behind me. Alone and in the dark, I could hardly comprehend what had just happened, when I felt a horrible and underwhelming sense of dread, and a strong compulsion to not turn around. I began to do what most children would do, scream and cry. My father heard my panicked screams from outside and charged into the house and bolted for my room. Grabbing the closet doors and attempting to yank them open to no avail, he began to beat on the doors, shattering them with his strength and commanding whatever it was to release them. Then, as if nothing had happened, the doors just opened. After this, the house seemed to become darker, feel colder. A looming sense of dread or being watched began to grow, and none of us liked being alone in the house anymore. My father, who's a fervent believer in Christ, didn't want to talk about it, and would spend much of his time in the workshop or outside, hoping that denying the situation's attention might solve it. My stepmother took a different approach. She took to spending most of her time in the kitchen, and began reading about cleansing the home. She eventually saged the house with my father's permission while he was at work. After that, things seemed to go somewhat neutral. Months passed and I left to visit my mother. 
Upon returning to the house, I no longer felt the excitement I once did. The feelings of pride that such a lovely home as ours were replaced by the dread of walking up those scarlet stairs. And looking down the dark hallway by my room, I could tell things had gotten worse, but my father wouldn't allow discussion of it. Until one night, the final straw broke. According to my dad, he woke in the night and got up to get some water. Figuring he would check on me in the process, he walked to my room and opened the door to see me. His son, standing on my bed, with my eyes rolled into the back of my head. Nothing but the white showing. Wording something but audibly speaking anything. And my arms jutting out in a stiff manner. Terrified, he grabbed me off the bed and immediately began praying and commanding whatever it was to leave in the name of Christ. Shortly after that experience, we moved in with my grandparents for a short while. 20 years later, and my father was surprised I remember these events with such detail, given that I was so young. It's still talked about in hushed tones. The only thing my dad will really say about it is that he thinks I was making the sign of the cross with my body. But he always described it like I was making more of an arrow with my body. I have some theories of my own, but would like some thoughts and opinions as well, as to what the whole wording but not speaking when it happened was all about. So I need some help on an incident that took place last night. A little backstory. I lived in my current home for 10 years. I've had some paranormal experiences throughout that time. It's more of a nuisance than threatening or scary, such as my children's toys turning on, things falling over, footsteps, and seeing movements out the corner of my eye. My son's radio on his power wheel was turned on and jamming out one night. I always have to go downstairs to turn whatever off. This particular situation, after turning off the radio, I heard a woman say, oh no, which didn't scare me. I never feel threatened, but more made me laugh and say, oh yes, it's a school night and the party's over. Also a few times, I've heard my lab slash day mix, Benny, whimpering. And after 10 years, I lost February to bone cancer. Well, last night was completely different. I'm a single mom of two children. My son, who's two years old, woke up around midnight after not wanting to go back to bed. I took him into my room so he wouldn't wake my daughter up. He kept sitting up, pointing in different parts of the room, while making the excited, ooh, ooh, sound he makes when he's trying to show me something important. I was half awake and looked over and saw a small, red, solid light under my desk. It looked like a small red light you'd see from a home security camera. As I tried to focus, it began to fade and I dismissed it as I wasn't fully awake. Then I kept catching it out of the corner of my eye, over the next hour while trying to get my son back to sleep. But every time I'd look in its direction, it seemed to fade back into the dark, causing me to question what I was seeing. The final time I saw it, my son sat up pooping while pointing at my closet, which is wide open. This time, the red dot of the light did not fade. It was about four feet off the ground inside the left of my closet. I'm fully focused in and trying to process what I was seeing. My curtains were closed. There was no reflection or trace so you'd see if it was a laser. After a few seconds of trying to process this, I thought, Ong, is that an eye? Even though there was no light to reflect off of it, like an animal eye would. Scared, I turned my phone's flashlight on, and then my TV for light, terrified to move. When I shined the flashlight onto my closet, nothing was there. Not the red light, not an animal, just my clothes. I left the TV on at that point to illuminate my room. My son then went to bed within 10 minutes of that, and I stayed up until I literally just passed out, but never saw the red light again. I talked to my mom this morning, and of course, she wants me to search my room for cameras, since it looked exactly like a red light you see on security cameras when they record. The only problem is that it wouldn't explain moving all around the room. I never saw it move. It just would pop up throughout the room, never higher than two to four feet off the ground. 
Does anyone have any ideas of what it could have been or experience with this? Any help would be appreciated. I had a very creepy and unexplainable experience last night at work. I work in a residential care at a house where five people with autism live. Yesterday, one of the girls called A was in a very bad mood all day. She was throwing tantrums, screaming and hitting herself. Sometimes she had some absent moments and stared at the ground or at a wall. This is very unusual behaviour because she had always been the most active and most well-behaved patient in the house. A has had some seizures recently and hasn't been herself since her most recent seizure last week. The experience happened at about 10 to 9 at night as we were waiting for the night shift staff to swap with us. Me, B and C were standing in the hall chatting as we waited. K was standing in the laundry room in the dark staring at a wall. We stayed outside the door in case anything happened to K. We were at the end of the hall and behind A was three doors. The kitchen door to the left, the sitting room door directly behind and the playroom door to the right. The kitchen and playroom door were open and held open by specialised door stoppers. The door stoppers are designed to lift and let the door close when lots of noise is made. The reason for this is if a patient is trying to attack staff, the closing doors slows down the patient so everyone can run. These doors closed by themselves without any loud noise being made. First the kitchen door closed and then the playroom door. We thought nothing of it since the playroom door stopper is faulty anyway. As soon as the playroom door closed, a vintage radio inside the room started playing static at full blast. B went into the room and took the radio out and showed it to me and C. We all freaked out because of the door closing and then an old radio coming on. I got up to check on Kay and she was still standing in the dark room, staring at nothing. I was so freaked out and couldn't look at her because I had the idea she was possessed or something. I have no reason to believe that, it's just my imagination. Night staff arrived and I ran for the hills. I was told the house I worked at was haunted, but I always laughed it off. I've seen shadows in the corner of my eye in one bedroom, but I always came up with an explanation for them, despite being very unsettled. The event has unnerved me so badly that I'm afraid of what I'll see next in the house. Maybe I would be like 9 or 10 years old. My dad used to go to the office on his motorcycle or bike and he used to come back in the evening from 5.30 to 6.30. I remember he used to come before it started to get dark, during summertime. Two houses away from our home, there was an empty ground where all the kids used to play in the evening. So just like any other day, I was playing there. I saw my dad on the bike. He stopped the bike and nodded at me like, let's go, or come here. But he didn't stop for me. So I thought he was obviously going home which was seconds away from where we were playing. So I thought he went directly home and wanted me to be home. That's why he nodded at me. To my surprise, when I went there, my dad wasn't there. So of course I thought he went straight to the house, which was strange, because as I said, the place where I was playing was just seconds away. And how fast he went inside the house at the time. I remember being a little confused, but I went inside the house. There was no one there inside the house, and I checked different rooms and there was no one there. We also have an upper floor. Now I was looking around the house. I heard a voice from the first floor clearly calling my name repeatedly. Like when someone calls you if there's something urgent or you're getting late. And I went upstairs to find out there was no one. I was so confused what the hell is happening. And suddenly I remember being scared and confused that I ran out of the house. Not panic or anything, but still went out in a hurry. So a few things that's not normal. One, that was not my dad, because my dad arrived later in the evening. Two, when I said I was playing, as I remember, my mum and brother also used to be out with me. So our house was locked as no one was there. I later asked my mum about this. She told me she was outside and house was locked. Three, 
The voice calling my name was not my dad's voice, nor my brother's voice, but it was a male voice. I've asked about this from my parents many times, but they, of course, as I was nine at the time, just ignored it. Currently, I'm 22, and to this date, I still don't know what that was, that set of events that happened that evening. On a weekday, during the time of the lockdown, this was the time when students had to do their schoolwork from home, I was half asleep in my bed and didn't get up for school, considering the fact my alarm didn't go off. I laid there in my bed for a while until I heard a knock at my bedroom door. I don't know the specific number of knocks if that's relevant, but all I know is that I heard a woman's voice talking to me. Wake up, it's 8.30. I assumed it was my mum, because she's the only lady in the house, and looked at my phone to check. It was 7.30, an hour before I had to wake up to start school. I was still dazed from laying there for so long, so I replied, Ma, I still have an hour. About an hour later, I went to the table for breakfast, and when my mum walked in the room, I brought it up. She looked at me confused and then answered my question. I never went to your door. I was walking the dog at that time, like I always do. That's when it hit me. That female voice at the door didn't sound anything like my mum. I shrugged it off by the time I had to show up for class, but during the break between the Zoom meetings, I soon realised something. Whoever that was, why and how did she know my name? Later, when all my classes were done, I told my family what happened. My older brother just brushed it off and said I was probably still dreaming, which didn't make much sense because it felt so real. And everything I came into contact with, I could feel. Meanwhile, my dad just frowned at me. Did you respond to it? That's all he asked. And when I confirmed it, he went on a rant on spirits and ghosts. My dad very much believes in this type of thing. And whenever we bring up this topic, he always mentions that he has a sixth sense. All he told me was that it's a bad thing I responded to. And it's even worse that whoever that was knew my name. So yeah, that happened. I just find it odd that whoever or whatever that was only did it once and never came back. Sometime last year in September, I was at a party at my relatives for someone's birthday. The party went as any would with a sprinkle of chaos here and there. Taking the opportunity of everyone being distracted, me and my cousin Robbie went into one of the unused rooms and hung out. After only a few minutes, he looked at me and says, I have a Ouija board, remember? I knew what he meant by that and grinned enthusiastically. Hell yeah, I've been looking forward to this. He nods, leaving the room. During that short wait, I looked around the room to the black chair in the corner, through the mostly blinds on the window, back to the closet, and the empty spot on the mattress in front of me. Robbie quickly came back in with the board and sat down on the mattress with me. He made sure to turn off the lights and light a candle, it being our only source of light because of how late in the night it was. Was anyone there? The first question most people ask when in a situation like this one. Both our hands were on the triangle, but only at our index fingers. Why were we being so gentle with a triangle made out of plastic was beyond me. Only a few seconds after we asked that question, the piece moved. Yes, it said. I went on a small glance to see Robbie looking down at the board. He's done this before, he told me. Now, I could tell for sure. He looked so calm and casual doing this, which eased me a little. With subtle excitement, I asked the question, What's your name? The triangle piece moved to the two characters, Z-D. Question after question, she never failed to reply. Not to mention the little time she took in answering. Robbie asked a few, but not as much as I did. Suddenly, Robbie came forth with one. Are you in the room right now? The, tr the triangle slowly moved to yes. Robbie and I looked at each other and back down at the board. We asked where exactly she was inside of the small room. Slowly, a word formed, but only a single one. 
chair. We turned our heads to face the black chair, and I half expected to see a dip in the leather to tell me where ZD was. There was nothing. Without thinking, Robbie blurted something out. Damn, you must have really long arms. I burst out laughing at the random comment. As we continued, Robbie and I moved to the floor. After discovering that ZD slept on the mattress we were sitting on, I asked the question that had wriggled its way into my mind. Do you have the ability to touch physical things, like us? This time, the triangle took more than usual in replying. It dragged down the board and landed on yes. Curiously, I asked if she would touch my hand, as I've heard that a person would usually get the chills, or it'll be cold. She silently gave me a yes, and I put forth my hand, waiting. Turns out, it's true. I felt a subtle cold in my hand and looked over at Robbie, confirming his silent question. We continued this little conversation before the subject turned dark with four words. How did you die? Her reply made me shudder and remember the cruelties of this world. Slowly, one by one, the letters began to form a word. Murder. I asked about it, trying my best to choose my words carefully. Was it by someone you knew? She revealed it to be her brother, and I quickly went over to my phone to find him. I did indeed find the guy, but then I snipped out of it and asked if she was uncomfortable with me doing it, and if I should stop. I was going to regardless, but she said yes. After I closed the tab, we continued. I remember so much from that night. It was thrilling, to say the least. However, the one thing that's been lingering on my mind is the answer to one of her questions. She said yes to being able to contact physical things. Despite being able to do so, she doesn't, and prefers to be a peaceful spirit. I could only look up to this person who'd already passed away. She even mentioned she forgives her brother. I can only wonder why such a person had to die. So I live way out in the thick of it. The place looks like a Bob Ross painting. I have a little cabin with a loft that I sleep in and an outhouse just a few steps away. Not a bad place, except for the stupid ghost noises that happen nearly every night. So it's pretty cold and the cabin is somewhat new, 2019-ish. So with extreme cold, there's gonna be some creaks, but I'm not hearing creaks. I hear footsteps in the snow just outside the windows, despite there being no footsteps in the 10 inch plus snow that's all around my cabin. There's thumping along the walls, even though there aren't any trees that are close enough to touch the cabin. Even if there were, for the whole time I've been here, there hasn't been wind faster than five miles an hour. They like to do their jumping by heating oil tank, which makes a nice metallic clanging sound. Originally, I thought it was someone trying to steal my oil, but again, no footsteps other than my own. Sometimes I could hear faint footsteps directly below me when I'm trying to sleep. Ever since I put one of my spare Bibles down there, the ghostly activity has been contained to outside of the cabin. If you think I'm going to apologize, you're mistaken. So at this time, I'm pretty used to it but it's annoying when I hear something banging on the side of the cabin while I'm trying to sleep. Is there a way I could at least get them to help with rent since they won't leave? In all seriousness, I don't really know what to do. I was raised in the bush, so I know that if I hear some weird noises in the woods during the night, I should mind my own business. And I know that I don't want to get mixed up in ghosts and spirits. So how can I make it clear to them if they're not to go in the cabin. My CO2 detector is in the clear. I'm pretty active. I work full time, go to church, go to the gym, and I visit my fiance often. So I don't think it's cabin fever. Someone told me that heating oil tanks just randomly makes noises. And yeah, that makes sense. But this isn't an occasional thump. It's a bang, 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 like someone was knocking on the door. When snow slides off the roof, it makes a good thump 
But these noises happen all the time. From snowing to not snowing. It's 30 to 40 degrees during the night. Local history isn't much to go off of. I'm still poking around, but from what I can see, this is just mining land. As in there weren't really many natives in the area. And miners just strolled in and started their mining. Simple as. Still no tracks in the snow other than my own. Nothing big enough to make footstep sounds. There were squirrel footprints on the porch this morning. But other than that, not a thing. There are trees kind of close to the outhouse, but not close enough to bump into it when the wind blows. I work in an extremely old building. My office is just like a small resource room that's inside the library. The first incident took place a little over a month ago. We were going through a grieving period on campus, and while I had no connection to who had passed, I couldn't help but wonder if perhaps it was them. I was sitting in my office with the lights dimmed as. I usually work better that way. I was so focused on my laptop that when I took a moment to write some notes down, I looked back up and saw what appeared to be a tall, slouchy figure behind me for a sec, and then it suddenly took off. I was so scared and caught off guard because I could see the shadow reflecting on my wall. My desk faces it. I followed it with my eyes as I saw the shadow slowly move on the wall. However, I was too scared to turn around and I remained in my seat for a moment before I gathered the courage to get my things and leave. I'll never forget that feeling. It was as if my blood had run cold and my breath was caught in my throat. I felt frozen and scared to death. The second instance was right before we left for Christmas break. The same scenario again where the lights were dimmed and I was heavily focused. Except this time, I didn't feel scared. I looked from my laptop at the wall in front of me for a brief second and I saw the shadow walk slowly right behind me. It felt different somehow. The energy didn't feel threatening but just calm. Something overcame me and I simply laughed and said something along the lines of Hello there. Want some peppermint candy? And as soon as I said that, it went away. I don't know why I chose to speak to it. It just kind of came out without me thinking. I truly don't know if it was the same entity as the first, but strange nonetheless. That very same day, my sister said she also saw something later that afternoon, as she works during the evenings. She and her co-worker needed a pair of sticky notes. And as my sister sat in one of the chairs in my room, which faced directly to the door entrance, she looked up from her phone briefly and saw that she describes to be a tall shadow zooming past my door. She thought it was a student at first, but realized that it couldn't have been, since they had already been dismissed. The lights in the library were off, and the only light shining was from my office. But she claims to have seen it clear as day. Freaked her out, but nothing really new to her, since she tends to see a lot of shadow people. Anyways, I just felt like sharing this because I never experienced something like this before. And if anyone has any thoughts as to what this could be, I'd appreciate it. My friend and I walked home together every day. We'd always finish our school day change into our normal clothes, and head out. We were 14 years old, instructed to always take the same route home. But we were running late, so decided to take a different route. The normal route has a bridge for cars and pedestrians. It crosses a six-lane highway, but closer to school. There was a pedestrian bridge that heads into the woods, but it's faster than our normal route. We head to the bridge, get there, no one to be seen, so it's all good. We go over the bridge, approaching the other side. We see a man sitting next to the bridge, with his head between his knees. As we get close, we hear him mumbling. We approach him. His back is facing us. We don't know what to do. So we decide to leave him because he's probably drunk. In the corner of my eye, I see something. 
I turned to see a man in work clothes, his arms in front of him, one hand holding the other, just standing behind us. We leave, we don't look back, this guy came out of nowhere. As we walk through the forest, we talk about school and sports and my friend stops, points, and tells me he wants to check out the weird rocks to the left of us. I agree, and we approach the area. As we get closer, I see that there's a bunch of those rocks, stacked one on another, forming a circle. A round slab stone is in the middle of it all. Symbols engraved in it, dry blood covers the stones. Small metal figures of some sort placed into the earth, with what looked like human hair on the ground. I stand in shock, as I'm not sure what I'm looking at. The screams caution, but I'm unable to move so I can leave. My friend makes a weird noise. I turn to see him looking in the distance. I see something getting closer. He grabs my shoulder. It sets me free from my status as a statue. We take off running. I hear movement of bushes behind me, breaking branches on the ground. Is something chasing us? I look back, but I can't see shit. I'm running as fast as my legs can take me. My friend pulling away slowly but surely. We kept running till we got to my house. It was about five kilometers from the stones and blood. My friend slipped over that night, not wanting to walk home alone. We go to school the next day, told our friends a story about the blood and stones we found, discussed what that place could have been used for, and decided not to go there again. The school day went by. My friend and I headed for the school gates so we can go home. Stepped outside, said goodbye to our other friends, and I feel a tap on my shoulder. I turn around, expecting to see a teacher or a student. I turned around to look into the man that was at the bridge, the one in work clothes. The questions I ask myself to this day, why was he there and how did he find us? I looked at this man in his emotionless face. He opened his mouth and said, that man next to the bridge, he's dead. Then turned around and walked away, leaving me and my friends speechless. We don't know anything about the blood and stone, never went back there again, but did see another one a few years later that also had weird shit going on. We spoke about this almost 10 years later, discussing the possibility that he killed the man next to the bridge and that we could have been next, but someone heard the story and phoned me, giving their opinion. He said, maybe it wasn't a person at all. Maybe it was a death collecting a soul. We were just at the wrong place at the wrong time. He just tried to protect innocent kids by coming to our school and telling us what he did. This occurred in the Rhode Island, Southern Connecticut area. I'll not give out the location. My girlfriend and I were sleeping in our van overnight. After finding a good place to sleep, we went there and cooked dinner. It was fine. I heard an animal walking around. It was strange it kept walking near us, but didn't think too much of it. The weird part happened as we were packing up. Our dog was looking off into the distance near this house and growling, then stared, then put her tail under her legs. For context, our dog tries to chase bears and I've never once seen her afraid of anything. Didn't think too much of it. She growls at trash bags sometimes. We walked a bit closer trying to see what it was, so we could comfort her. We didn't see a thing. She left to go in with our dog, but I linger. I knew something was going on. I look a few times, nothing. I then look again as I give up, not looking at anything, just staring ahead, not focusing on anything. That's when I saw what looked like a giant stag. The torso was too big for its body, and it seemed to stand at about seven feet. It's walking along the side of the house, about two or three seconds into staring, it sees me. I immediately went into the van. Now, let it be known that I never believed in ghosts, and just started believing in entities in the past few years. I'm unsettled. I keep looking over from our van window and nothing. Still, I can feel something. We brushed our teeth, went to bed, that was that. Still heard rustling, 
and I heard what sounded like a book call, but wasn't too worried about that. What I assume is an hour or two passes, and I wake up to this clicking noise at the pace of a clock. It sounded like a thick shell and a mallet, or two bones clicking. I go back to sleep because I don't feel in danger. I wake up three or four more times. What I notice is it sounds like it's about 10 feet or so by the van. This is just for me. It walked in straight lines, turned at a 90 degree angle and went along the perimeter of my body without walking into my girlfriend's side. Back and forth, back and forth. I remember dreaming that night. I have many capabilities in the astral realm, being able to visit people in dreams, create expanses, etc. I remember being in a white expanse and sitting with a being with grey skin, antlers and crow feathers for hair. Skin wasn't gross looking, it just looked like grey skin. It said no one would be able to handle the pressure. That's all I remember. My question is, what in the fuck was this thing? Has anyone heard about this entity? I need some help here. I will also say for a few nights after in different areas, I heard movement and two of the nights I heard the same book call when something hit our front window. There were also scratches on one of our windows on the exact door that I was fighting the thought of it coming through. These scratches are no way from a rock. They are all intersecting and angular in a basically a vague circle. A few years after my parents split up when I was very young, my dad moved into my stepmom's house. This was previously her grandmother's house that had been left to her. It was a beautiful house that was right next to a stretch of country fields and both of my younger brothers were born there. And as a family, we all shared many happy memories there. However, as a family and also with me personally, a few experiences make me wonder if the house was haunted. I've always been the sort of person that has felt strange or unwelcome in certain places. For example, hated visiting an old family friend's house when I was younger and felt extremely on edge and almost heavy every time we visited, which I then several years later found was previously an execution site where people were hanged. Anyway, that could have just been my own paranoia of being in a place I wasn't too familiar with. In my dad's old house, we had several experiences. I never ever liked going upstairs by myself, even as I got older. It actually got worse. I always used to make the dog come with me. I also never wanted to be alone in the house, even just in a room alone. I always felt like I was being watched or unsafe. My stepmom told me when I was a lot older, one night she was woken up by a bang coming from directly below her bedroom. This was the end of the kitchen, which had a door going out into the back garden. Worried about an invasion, she went downstairs and checked the doors. They were all locked from the inside. Then she noticed one of the square decorative shelves on the wall had fallen onto the floor. My parents kept photos of me and my brothers on these. She went over, expecting to have to tidy up all of our pictures. But they weren't there. They were stacked up neatly on the radiator in a pile. My dad hadn't touched them, and they were up way too high for any of us kids to reach. No one else had been in the house. My stepmom told me years later, she always used to smell her grandmother's perfume at the top of the stairs. My dad and stepmom would frequently be watching TV in the evenings, and an old jewellery box would start playing. I would always feel like I was being watched in my room. Once it was pitch black before I fell asleep, and I felt the pressure of someone sitting on the end of my bed. My dad built me and my brothers a tree house at the bottom of the garden. My brothers were slightly too young to play in it unaccompanied, so I mainly played there alone. But I always felt a sense of dread and immediate danger there, like I was being watched. I always used to sprint up the garden like I was being chased and back into the house, until I found one of my parents or the dog. At this point in time, I was going through a phase where I would jump scare people. It was funny. My brother got the majority of the jump scares, so he was paranoid at every turn, 
because I could be hiding behind something. We were living in a two bedroom apartment and we had to share a room, closet, bathroom, etc. So one summer night, I'm outside in my car smoking a cigarette and talking to some people. My phone rings and it's my brother. He asks where I'm at and I say I'm outside the apartment smoking. He keeps asking me where I really am and stop lying. I'm getting pissed and scared because I hate being called a liar and he never acts like this. So I ask him in a serious tone, what the fuck is going on? He says he thinks he saw it. I park my car and go home. I ask him what happened and why he thinks he saw it. He says he saw our bedroom door slightly open. As soon as you open the door, my bed is right there in front of you. The room was dark, but he says he saw the imprint of someone sitting on the edge of my bed. He says he spoke to it, thinking it was me trying to scare him. He told me he said, Nando, is that you? I know it's you who stopped playing. Stop trying to scare me. I can see you, bitch. Then the figure gets up and walks into our closet. He continues, Nando, stop playing. I know you went in the closet. I'm not stupid. He turned on the lights and went in the closet to look for me. But it was empty. That's when he called me. His opinion on paranormal changed after that. He knew not to mess with any of it. My grandma is from Alancho, Honduras. In those times, the only way to reach her area was by plane, because there were no roads and it was very unsafe to travel by car. At the time, my grandma was fighting for my grandfather's love with another woman. Of course, my grandmother won and had four kids and many grandchildren. Fast forward and I'm 14 years old staying at my grandmother's apartment. The reason being, we were gonna drive to Florida. It was gonna be me, my little brother, my mother, my aunt, and her friend. But I was staying at my grandmother's until we left in the morning. I was sleeping in the living room. I had to pee, so I put my pants on. With that mission accomplished, I looked for the light switch on the exit door to the apartment. For some reason, I couldn't see it even though it wasn't dark at all. The living room was just dimly lit. You could see everything in perfect clarity, but for some reason, there was no switch. So I turned my head towards the left where there was a hallway towards the bathroom. I walk towards the switch, but before I do, I see a black figure. Not a shadow, but a completely black hooded figure just standing there. I was thinking that my eyes were adjusting after just waking up. So I walk towards the switch, but as soon as I did that, the figure walked towards me. I got scared and walked faster towards the switch and the figure began to walk faster as well. I thought that if I turned on the lights, it would go away. I get to the switch and turn it on. The figure was in my face for a split after turning on the lights. I didn't say anything to anyone because I knew nobody would believe me. Fast forward to the next day on the road to Florida, we all heard albums, told stories, and one story my aunt said revealed everything. Apparently, she met with a palm reader from El Salvador she said that the palm reader told her about her future and something from our family's past. Apparently, when my grandmother was fighting with the other woman to win my grandfather's love, the other woman went to her mother, who appeared to be a voodoo priestess and put a curse on my family. She went on to repeat that the woman told her about the curse. Your family will be haunted by a voodoo god. It's a black figure, no face. It will not harm you but it will let you know it's there. I said, bull fucking shit. Tell me you're lying. Say you're fucking lying. I then told them what I had seen the night before. The rest of the drive was quiet after that. A couple years after, my brother saw the figure on my bed. I'll tell that story if anyone is interested. I will always remember the events of this day. It was the weekend the Captain America, the Winter Soldier movie came out in the United States, April, 2014. A month before this movie came out, my cousin flew down from Dallas, Texas and stayed with me and my girlfriend up near Seattle, Washington in a small town called Bothell. 
my cousin had been aware of our ghost sort of speech, meaning she knew just enough to still want to come. To be safe, she bought a gift for me and my girlfriend. Hopefully, this cross will protect us. Written on it were the chapters Joshua 1 9, Phil 4 13, Psalm 28 7, and Matthew 19 26. Each verse spoke about maintaining one's strength, one's faith during troubling times. My girlfriend and I had been having a strong poltergeist like activity, so reading something was extremely helpful. When my cousin arrived, she handed me the cross. We prayed over it and placed it in our bedroom. That's where my cousin said it would protect us. Keep it above your bed in your bedroom. A month later, the cross went missing. Understanding missing objects, religious objects especially, is not a new phenomenon in our house. Things get taken all the time. Sometimes they return, sometimes they don't. The items that do return are never found in their original spot. This cross would be no exception. The question my girlfriend and I ask ourselves when an item such as this goes missing is, what the heck's going on? I mean, we're talking about a sizable cross here. Six inches long, four inches wide. It's not something you can misplace. How could we? We nailed high above our bed on the wall. It's gone now. No use looking for it. Only two people are living in the house. My girlfriend and I fast forward to the premiere of the Captain America movie. It's Saturday morning. The cross has been missing for over a week now. I began doing my laundry early that day, earlier than usual. I figured it's best to get my chores done if I'm going to the movies later on. I'm excited. I'm going to see a Marvel movie with one of my best friends. Let me get this laundry done ASAP. I began my first load of laundry. Coloured clothing. My girlfriend, Tina, is walking around the house doing her own thing. I decided to go to my office and watch TV and wait for my clothes to wash. About an hour later, I noticed something peculiar. My first load of clothing was still washing. Now I know there are long wash cycles, but this was weird. My brain knows how long it takes for my clothes to wash. I'm pretty sure I didn't set the washing machine to the long wash cycle. It's taken exceptionally long this time. That's unusual. I glanced toward the washroom, hoping to hear the beep. You know the noise the washing machine makes when it's done? So I glance at the washroom and look at the clock on my computer. I think to myself, what's taking my clothes so long to wash? A few minutes later, I hear this knocking sound. You know, the sound the washing machine or dryer makes when something big is inside, like a shoe or something. The noise I'm hearing is coming from the washing machine. Once again, I'm glancing up from my PC and looking at the washroom. What could be making that noise, I wonder? At this point, the wash cycle had been running for nearly an hour far too long for what I put inside. Normally I would get up and see what the commotion was about. I didn't this time. I kept watching TV. Finally, the washing machine beeps, informing me that the load was complete. Time to remove the clothing. I'm passive as passive can be. No hurry whatsoever, as I was pulling out my clothes and tossing them into the dryer. I immediately grabbed hold of something solid. Not clothing, not shoes, not anything except a metallic wooden cross. I didn't know what it was until I pulled it out of the washing machine. There in my hand in two pieces is the cross my cousin gave me. Now some might say, well, maybe the cross was in there to begin with. Not so. As I mentioned prior, they would have been heard early on. The thumping noise, I mean. The knocking noises I heard began 15 minutes before the washing was complete. Secondly, the washing machine was empty when I used it. Some might say, maybe you accidentally put the cross in the machine when you loaded the clothes. Wrong again. I sorted my clothing carefully, meaning items went into the machine almost one at a time. This size was not going to be grabbed by mistake. Even if it was, I would have heard the bumping noise way sooner than I did. Maybe your girlfriend put it in by mistake. My girlfriend was nowhere near the washing machine that day, and I never left my office. The washroom sits right outside my office. She wouldn't stop my wash load regardless. I do my laundry, she does her laundry. It's important that I get those particulars out of the way, for fear of people gravitating towards the obvious explanation.
and that's understandable. Now allow me to paint the picture as near as perfect as possible, because it hasn't even begun to get weird yet. In my hand is the cross my cousin gave me. It took a sort of beating in the washing machine. It's broken up now. I then called my, called my girlfriend to the room. We both examined the cross from top to bottom. Here it is again after being gone for about a week. This cross would disappear and get thrown a few more times before finally being left alone. So a couple of weeks ago, I was on FaceTime with my girlfriend and had an odd experience. From behind me in my room, I heard an odd noise that sounded as if someone had been pressing their hand against the window furthest from me in my room and moving it from one side to the other. I saw the window at the tail end of the noise happening and saw nothing outside my window. I was a little weirded out, but didn't think too much of it. Minutes later, I heard the exact same noise, except this time it was the window right behind me. This time I was able to see out the window through almost the entire duration of the sound and saw nothing whatsoever that could have caused it. I was pretty confused and frightened, but before long, I forgot about it. Fast forward a day or two ago, and I had my second encounter, and this time it was much scarier. Once again, I was on FaceTime with my girlfriend, this time at around 3am, and I heard a very strange noise. The noise kind of sounded like a combination of a woman screaming, a cat screaming, and a wolf howling. What's extra weird about this noise is that it sounded as if it travelled from one end of my house to outside my door behind me, coming from the aforementioned window. It's notable that my mother was in the house, though very much asleep, as well as my cat, once again asleep. It's also worthy of note that I live in a more country setting, with my house being in the middle of 10 acres of land, with neighbours quite far away, and we don't get walls here. I digress. As soon as I heard the noise, my heart dropped and started to tell my girlfriend about it. But before I could utter any words, she told me to look behind me. I refused, as I assumed she now saw how startled I was and was messing with me. She then said there was a face. I once again refused to look. She then screenshotted the call and sent me the image. I looked, and sure enough, it was a face. The face looked male. Pale, gaunt, and with what looked like three slashes beneath its right eye. Bald also. I was in shock. I then looked, and nothing was out there. I spent the next hour or so trying to rationalise it. I took an image in the exact same spot to see if it was a reflection. It wasn't. I checked if it could have been a person trespassing, but then realised that person would have had to have been extremely tall, or had a ladder which I would have heard or seen. After quite a bit of time, freaking out, I ended up hearing two extremely loud footsteps right outside my door. It sounded as if someone was trying to get my attention. There were two other people in the house, but I highly doubt it was them, as I likely would have heard more than two steps, as the floor is quite creaky here. I'm not usually the type to really believe in ghosts or anything like that, but I couldn't rationalise this one. Near central California, there's an old mining community that you've probably heard of called the Motherlode. It's an area of California that was a large part of the gold rush. This is where the story takes place. On the way out of town, down a long road, almost like a stretch of highway, you suddenly veer off to the right and go down a rough, older road, less than a quarter mile down. The road dead ends into a circle parking area with a gate at the end, which is kept locked by the city. If you were to go past the gate, you would end up at a popular lake in my area. When you park at the end, you're basically surrounded on one side by steep hills dotted with poison oak and tall pine and oak trees. The other side is a steep downhill slope to the lake. So basically, you're in a bowl. We were told that if we were to go up to the left, up the steep hill, that there would be an old mine, long abandoned by the miners, that the country didn't close. 
About 250 feet up the steep hill, we found the old mine, almost hidden in a slight divot in the hillside that you wouldn't see unless you walked right up it. To get into the mine, you had to glide, climb down a slight slope into the ground and go over some medium-sized rocks on the ground, leftovers from when they blasted into the mountain. The mine itself was about seven feet tall and six feet wide, which formed a tunnel that was about 250 feet into the mountain. The mine had rough rock walls with a colorful vein running along the left wall. The vein is said to indicate the presence of gold by its ribbons of colors. The tunnel followed along that vein, taking at least two turns with a couple of short dead-ended offshoots. As you got deeper into the mine, you had to step carefully to avoid mud, which is what the old ore cart tracks were handy for. Ore carts hold blasted rocks out of the mine, unlike mini railroad tracks. Once you were inside the mine, it was completely and utterly dark and silent, except for the sounds of the wind howling and dripping water. We took our time walking into the dark tunnel until we eventually reached the tunnel's end, a wall of solid rock. Disappointed, we started on the way back to the entrance. My buddy decided to stop near the entrance to chip some sample rock from the vein in the wall. He promised to be quick, so I just stood and waited for him. I stood there for a couple of minutes before I heard the first strange sound. It sounded like a small pile of rocks toppling over, echoing up to the shaft towards us. I tried to tell my buddy what I just heard, but he didn't hear me, so I just let it go. Not even two minutes later, I heard it again, that time closer. That time, I got his attention to tell him what I just heard, but he just thought I was being paranoid. He said, you're just hearing an echo from me. I tried to make, take his word for it, but again, not even two minutes later, there it was again. That time, the sound came with a feeling of panic and fear. That was when I literally just said, you only have to be faster than your slowest friend. Then I just took off running, over the rocks and out of the mine. When he came out a few minutes later, he said he walked back to the end and didn't see any fallen rocks. I didn't go back there until a few years later, with another buddy of mine. Same as before, up the steep hill we went, the mine looked exactly as it did before, front to back, with no signs of a cave-in. Just as my other buddy had done before, my other buddy just had to stop on the way out to chip away at that damn vein winding along the left wall. As I was standing there waiting, I heard another strange, scary sound. But that time, it sounded like a rattle, and we both heard it. The only way we could describe it was that it sounded just like a baby rattle. We both froze and looked at each other, puzzled and anxious, illuminated in each other's headlamps. Not even a couple minutes later, we both heard it again. The sound of a baby rattle, we both grew up here, so we knew it wasn't a rattlesnake or anything, which are common here. When we heard it the third time, the creepy feeling came right back to me, and I just ran out there as fast as I could, practically tripping on the rocks on the way out. I haven't gone back since. I can't describe it. Something about that old mine just came with a bad, scary feeling, and both people that went there with me felt it as well. Later in the evening at around 7.30 one night, my buddy and I were bored so we decided to go to the Knights Ferry, California. Knights Ferry is an old preserved small town on a river for tourists to whitewater raft or explore the old bridge and brick buildings, which have bars on all the entrances and windows for obvious reasons. Since it was after dark, the small village was all ours to wander and explore as we pleased. We did this for about half an hour, our footsteps echoing off the looming dark old brick factories and stores. My buddy realized he forgot his phone in his truck and left me near the old bridge while he went to go check it or whatever. About 10 minutes later, I was just starting to wonder where the heck he was when he suddenly came jogging up to me, pale faced. Through his huffing and puffing, he managed to get out that we had to leave because something had spooked the shit out of him. He waited to tell me until we were in his truck and on our way out of there. He told me 
that he had seen a shadow in the shape of a man with glowing yellow eyes standing in the doorway on the other side of the bars in one of the main buildings. He said that when he lit up with his flashlight, he could see right through it. Of course, I made him turn right the hell around so that I could go check it out. When we got back there, he absolutely refused to get out the truck. So I grabbed his flashlights and went alone back to the building to check it out. I thought I heard a couple of strange sounds and I definitely got chills and an eerie feeling. But unfortunately, I didn't see anything. 